five seconds to submergence, submergence deep into the absurd. All right, we got another episode of Into the Absurd. It's going to be part seven, the magic number. Some might even call it the number of God. It's the holy number. It's it's also the number that uh, Harry. It was Harry Potter's favorite number, and uh, it was also the number of Horcruxes that Voldemort had. I don't know if you're familiar with Harry Potter, but it's very. Uh, it's a good series. It's a good series. But we got Mana Mia Stone on here for Self Reliance Part Seven. Hey, thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, welcome back. Um, so you had some notes for me. Yeah, well, Nietzsche does. Uh, these aphorisms are from the gay science, uh, okay. you know, and there's there's a there's a striking resemblance, albeit, you know, maybe there's a bit of a I'm not going to say a blind spot in here. But, um, you know, it's not a, the things he's, he's talking about here aren't apparent. Uh, if you want to start us off with the first aphorism. Differences. Wait, it's in the yeah, differences. In the, All right. Yes. Cool. Differences in the dangerousness of life. You don't know at all what you experience. You run through life as if intoxicated and now and then fall down a stair. Thanks, however, to your intoxication, you still do not break your limbs. Your muscles are too languid and your head too confused to find the stones of the staircase as hard as we others do. For us, life is a greater danger. We are made of glass. Alas, if we should strike against anything, and all is lost if we should fall. That's dude. That reminds me of a. Have you ever seen Unbreakable, or maybe, or is it called Unbreakable? It's yes. with Bruce Willis. Yeah, you can almost see it if we if we contrast that notion in that movie. I've never seen the movie, but I heard the premise, and it's like in the context of this aphorism, I would say that the average idiot is unbreakable, right? Like, you know, that, yeah. that's what he's saying here versus, you know, the sensitive type, the thinker, the, the one who devises a gay science in the first place, right? The one who yeah. sees more, um, you know, it's a very, they're playing a very different game. They see very different visions. You know, their perception is very different. The way they intuit is different. Um, so you see the discrepancy. You know, and it's, it's funny. It's like, yeah, how, how is it, you know, that it, it was all, it, it's like, you know, it's, so you got to obviously survival mechanism, you know, kids can take, you know, kids, ki- a kid could fall down and bump his head really hard, but his salt, his, his uh, skull is cushioned enough and his brain is cushioned enough that, you know, he can take quite a beating all told. Yeah. You know, and then psychically speaking uh, of our mind, our emotions, it almost seems no different. Like, like, the the intoxicated one, you know, there's echoes of Heraclitus in here, uh, generally kind of Greek or even Easter, farther Eastern thinking in general, right? You know, look at them, the sleepers, it's as if they're drunk, it's as if they're asleep, it's as if, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, yeah, you know, Jesus is and it's like, disciples. yeah, and it's like that provides quite a cushion, you know, they fall down and it's just like, okay, well, we'll try, you know, what's, what's the message? Like, oh, we'll try better next time. Or, you know, you just... You, it's, it's a very unthinking process, let's say, and it's going to continue. It, it, we, that'll be made more apparent as we go on. Yeah. Um, let's see on the notes here. Yeah. And it's like, okay, these were my thoughts. Is that that very force? It's like that, well, that was kind of instilled by culture, you know, yeah. that we don't have to think that we share a common language, that we share common sentiments, things like that. They exist so we don't have to think whether we fall down or not you know, it's kind of laid out for us. So do you also think that it's a protection? Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's protection. And you're saying in this no, you're saying that the creative culture generally don't want people to think. And I was just uh, thinking about with our culture no, right now. You need now, to channel the psychodrama. You have to channel yeah. the psychodrama, but you generally don't want people to think. And honestly, try, it seems like, a, you know, this is going to be an echo of a Gurdjieff's thoughts, but you know, to make people think is almost like to put them further to sleep with most people. You know, it's a very strange thing with us. Yes. And I think people who are sort of like powerful or intelligent, they do sometimes consider themselves as made of glass because they find 
that things in this life are far more fragile or far more fragile than most people think they are. Yeah. Oh, sure. And, and you have much more to lose. That's yeah, there's more thing. Like, yes, absolutely. And Nietzsche talks about, you know, once, once you kind of get there, it's like, well, then why wouldn't you take the challenge? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I want to say it might not be in this, because the, this, these are very short maxims here, but uh, it's either somewhere, somewhere in the gay science, he actually taught, like, he, there's an aphorism dedicated to that, kind of that concept you just mentioned there. Um, how about what we lack? Read that one. What we lack. We love the grandeur of nature to have discovered it. That is because human grandeur is lacking in our minds. It was the reverse with the Greeks. Their feeling towards nature was quite different from ours. All right. So do you, does that ring a bell? Cause it should. Yeah. Not that's okay too. Cause this is kind of, cause well, I know why you put this note in here, right? Because uh, it relates yes. to Emerson's nature. We, 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 we just read this aphorism in Emerson's own words, right? Yeah. Uh, not too long ago. Um, it's the sentiment, obviously, um, that our language is a reflection of nature and the labels and values we assigned there. And, you know, these, uh, the, the words became symbols for what we perceived, right? We labeled it good and bad, went from there. Um, and it was always a reflection of ourselves, right? And, and then all our religion and all our culture and everything therein is a perpetuation of ourselves, right? And the whole thing is self-protected, you know? Uh, I guess if we go to look at Zapp's thoughts, you know, in The Last Messiah, and he talks about anchoring, and he says the he talks about the outer walls and ramparts, uh, ramparts, and then like the inner circles and all that. You know, if you think of the mind following that structure, as well as culture itself, being a larger uh, manifestation that doesn't exist concretely because it only exists so long as we're alive, let's say, right? The moment, you know, if we were all dead and gone, then like, where's the culture? It's like, well, it ceased to be, you know, what's left of it is our objects, right? They're, they might as well be like a tree trunk rotting in the woods and because eventually that'll be gone too. But it's alive inside of us uh, is where it lives. Um, so do you think culture is almost the personality of a people? Yes, it's, it's expressed therein. Uh, and then, you know, if you really want to see their value tables, you look at what they label good and bad. Uh, that's how you get to a heart of them. And you'll see that with most people, like we've been playing the same games a long time, fundamentally, uh, around language, around values, around who established them, and then who wants to overthrow them. Yeah, and and oh, go on. I, I was just going to say specifically, uh, loving the, uh, the grandeur of nature. Uh, because human, this reminds me, this specifically, I was thinking of uh, Emerson's nature and where he, we, we've talked, we've mentioned this a few times, but here it is appropriate again, uh, not necessarily the, uh, referencing the God in runes or man being a dwarf of himself, um, but specifically because we, we, we lack the ability to appreciate or measure our fellow man, right? That's why, that's why Nietzsche here says human grandeur is lacking in our minds. Like it's, it's hard to conceive, um, or it's hard to, given the history, given what we can see before our eyes, it's like, you know, that it, why, you know, we don't worship gods. Why would we worship men? You know, hmm. if a God is all powerful and you don't worship that, like how, how much less so a man? Um, that's yeah. not necessarily, you know, this is, this is, you know, one of many reads or one of many ideas here. And, um, but a man you can see, you can touch and you can hear his words right well you know they were they were they were agreed to the psychodrama they were they were agreeable to the psychodrama they had a much more life-affirming philosophy uh nature was man was large and beautiful you know to them um and they didn't need as much not gonna uh, a lot not not i'm not saying elaboration what's the word when your elaboration is a not gonna say a farce but a um I don't know, explanations, justifications, rationalizations, yeah. uh, you know, it just seems like we have a lot of bad conscience to hide, you know, a uh, modern man, the, the modern American. Um, you know, you say that and it's interesting because yeah, we do often like explain ourselves in situations where we don't really need to explain ourselves. Well, that's the proverbial confessional. I mean, part of that's Christianity. Part of that's yeah. an organic part of the culture of once upon a time, you kept that 
shit to the priest and he was the one who held the power and you know you were actually very beholden to them um like you, religion wasn't something the average person possessed uh that freedom wasn't something like that any kind of notion of freedom therein was not something the average person possessed and even the americans who tried to kind of get away from that which again was a justification for their desire for power right in religion or otherwise uh, if you remember the story there, if you remember your history, right, uh, the original Americans left Europe. Uh, they had their reasons. Let's oh, see yeah. here. I was looking down uh, a little bit further here in the notes. I mean, my grandpa came from Norway after World War II. So. Yeah, to get away from all the crazy people over there. Yeah, well, his whole country was destroyed, so. Yeah, that, well, I'm, yeah. I imagine you'd want to. You might want to leave it too. Uh, go okay. Maybe you know. Maybe there's greener pasture somewhere. Maybe just needed to, yeah. needed to change it up a bit. He's like, okay, enough uh, war torn Europe. Uh, enough yeah. Uh, atrocity. Yeah, well, was, the whole country was occupied, so right. It'd be rough. And then you know, uh, people as culture, you know, I guess it, it, you know within your own culture you don't consider yourself occupied per se but yeah. that's because that's because you're already a part of that in group and you're already a part of um, that dom- that like that domesticating process yeah but to people who really aren't a part of that or who live outside of that or who have had bad experiences with that uh, then you know they have a very different view or just people who see it differently again uh, back to earlier we were talking about different perceptions. Well, it's like when you're driving in your car and your brakes slowly start getting worse and worse and worse. So you don't notice it. Then, oh. then your girlfriend comes in your car and it's like, your brakes are like going to give out, Greg. And then, <laughs> and oh, then I've, I've had that happen cute. before driving. <laughs> I've had that happen before on a hill driving in the rain. Oh, your brakes gave out. It was, it was this oh. work back in the day. And I, I warned him, I'm like, I'm like, uh, your brakes seem like they're messed up. And she's like, no, my car's fine to drive. I don't, I shouldn't, it was my fault. I should never agree to it. Um, we we're using her car for work purposes. Uh, That's rough. Yeah. Luckily the, the e-brake had it, you know, we were able to like land cockeyed wow. in the intersection, uh, jammed on the e-brake and we, we, we lived. So that was good. Uh, yeah, dude, that'd be scary. yeah. Better than a roller coaster. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it was more fun than a roller coaster. So, all right, how about the next aphorism? All right, the most influential person the fact that a person resists the whole spirit of his age, stops it at the door, and calls it to account must exert an influence. It is indifferent whether he wishes to exert an influence. The point is that he can. So, you know, he can be, he, he's easily talking about himself. He's easily talking about Socrates. He does this all the time. Uh, you know what I mean? Like where it says something and it's like, oh, he's giving himself away a bit here, or he's referencing himself or he's referencing someone else. Um, Cause you know that a lot of his ideas and criticisms and whatnot to other philosophers apply to him just as much. Um, very rarely does he directly mention that, but you know, he knows that and it's apparent in his writing as well. Yes. Um, you know, there's many subtle winks and nods. Um, so so I was, uh, well, that's like, so true though. You know, it's like, it's like we, like people, philosophers or anyone who aspires to do anything, they want to exert people and they do it because they feel as if they can. Right. And they, well, you could, you say it's their, their happiness or their karma, yeah. right. It's just the way they're operate. You know, it's not, yes. It's like, okay, you know, what's a lion's happiness? What's a, yeah. what's a, what's a dog's happiness? Uh, what's a human's happiness? And then, you know, you can think of any of the great thinkers, uh, old or new, uh, liberal or conservative, you know, this or that. You know, I wrote down examples like from Socrates to Voltaire to, you know, one of my favorites, Diogenes, because to Diogenes, Greek civilization was just the background noise where he placed his barrel. Yeah. And then, you know, and I could ask how many people, in fact, remember Diogenes. And out of everyone, it's like a handful out of many in total, you know, and the question remains for, I think, Western scholars and Western thinkers. It's like, is there anyone as good as Diogenes right now? It's like, "Eh, it doesn't look like it. 
And then from there, it's like, and then how many people who might value someone like a Diogenes, like if they met one, if they met a Diogenes, would they, would they be afraid? Would they hurry on and pass on by? Would they even understand? You know, and that's a serious question there. Um, you know, make sure we're not giving lip service as to why, you know, why we remember a, a Diogenes. Yeah. Because um, the audacity of it. Hmm. So mentiri, right? It's Latin. Take care. He reflects. There's another aphorism 157 uh, from the gay science still. Take care. He reflects. He will have a lie ready immediately. This is a stage in the civilization. Uh, this is a stage in the civilization of whole nations. Consider only what the Romans expressed by mentiri. You know, he will have a lie ready and immediately, right? I said culture, yes. culture is protected. That, that's from the outer ramparts to the inner walls. The whole thing is protected, whether, you know, and whether, you know, those protections are lies or errors is irrelevant. Uh, what matters is that they exist. You know, uh, they were incidental in the interplay of large forces. Yes. And then my know, you know, it's like, and then you wonder in the evolution of a civilization, you know, what stage exactly is that when there's a lie ready immediately, like for everything, you know, and there and, is, I mean, that's kind of what today is, or like, you know, I mean, I don't want to go so far as say a lie, but there's a, there's words ready for every situation right oh Some yeah Discla disclaimers and warnings yeah, and considerations no you better explain yourself you you mentioned this earlier let's not let it escape us here right like you know everyone explains uh when we're gonna get this further right everyone ex uh, expects an explanation uh this is part of uh you know culture keeping you close it's like well i need to what's what show me your hands right what are you hiding what's in your mind show me what you're hiding let me make sure it's good if it's bad well, you know we got we got solutions for that like we'll yeah. send you to a camp, we'll re-educate you somehow, right? We'll figure something out. Um, and I and I was actually when I said that I was specifically thinking like fat camp or gay camp or you know yeah. fill in the blanks. And it, 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 we actually treat people that way, right? You know, yeah. you think of a school, it's like we don't think of it as a factorial system, but it is. Um, yeah. It is a it the is a grinder. People, yeah, it's a people factory. Um, you know, and what kind of people have we produced? You've don't seen answer. the wall, right? Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, yeah, that but scene guess, in like another brick in the wall when all the children are just going through the meat grinder, turn you into sausage. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So I'll read one fifty eight here. An inconvenient peculiarity to Go find every okay to find everything deep is an inconvenient pe peculiarity. It makes one constantly strain one's eyes, so that in the end one always finds more than one wishes. Right. And I could say, you know, if only we were that simple, you know, to the, yeah. to the analytical mind, it's like, no, 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 we know there's a reason for every, you know, this is, this almost goes back to the first aphorism you read, like, yeah. no, 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 this is night and day here, you know, um, you're, you can go fall down, you can go live life as if drunk, you can, everything can be as simple as you need or want it to be, right, it's uh, yeah. to, depending on people's temperaments and needs and desires and all that. Um, we're getting into Zaps territory here. Yes, right. This would be uh, consciousness as a double-sided blade, right? Um, yeah, that it can e it easily turns against itself. For Emerson's own words, where he says earlier in this essay itself, self-reliance. Uh, Emerson talks about mankind. You know, this is like Zapp's own words, right? Uh, mankind being uh, clapped into prison by his own consciousness. Uh, if you remember reading that in this essay, and tell you what, going ahead. Uh, let me see if I had any notes on that. Oh, uh, I also thought when I read this. My thoughts are, this is another way of saying, if you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back. Yeah. To find everything deep is an inconvenient peculiarity. It makes one constantly strain one's mind. So the end of one is finds more than one wishes, right? You recognize something looking back at you. You recognize, like, maybe it would be nice to say, okay, am I just crazy? Am I just stupid? Maybe, maybe all those things that any, everyone else might've said about me. Cause no, throughout your, and I, cause I guess there's this notion of if a lot of people think you're an asshole, maybe you're an asshole. And yeah. maybe that's true. But in an Emersonian sense, in the sense of have you discharged, you know, your debts, let's say, have, you know, if you've, uh, if you've cleared yourself in the direct way or the indirect way, now you stand at a different place 
if you see and parse things differently, now how does it start to look again when you realize that, okay, to your political science teacher, you were going to be a speechwriter or a politician. To your Catholic stepmom, you were going to be a priest, right? To your mathematician mom, you were going to be a math teacher, right? And on the down the list you go. And then, and then things begin to look very different, don't they? Yes. Yeah, and all these influences kind of press on you over time. They kind of hammer into yes. you. They create you kind you. of get like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. They sculpt you in a sense. Oh, very much so. So go on ahead and read every virtue has its time, please. The honesty of him who is at present inflexible often causes him remorse for, for inflexibility is the virtue of a time different from that in which honesty prevails. Hmm. So it's funny because it's not it's not common that you see Nietzsche talk about something like remorse. You know, if you've taught if he's talking about pity, remorse, guilty conscience, it's usually to dig it out, to root it out, to kill it, to attack it, yes. to derisively snort at it, right? All these things. But to to see him mention remorse here, a very uh, you know, in such a short aphorism, and for it to take such a large part, it's pretty big, actually. So my question for you would be, why do you think he's uh, why do you think it causes him remorse? Well, for one, let's make a distinction here because uh, remorse is different than guilt. Yes. Um, guilt is more of a, it's more of a one-sided thing where you're like trying to protect yourself or it's, it's kind of like, a, it's almost selfish in a sense, but remorse is different because with remorse, you can actually feel it, it involves empathy in a sense. Um, it involves right. like well, it's supposedly deep, contemplating what you did. It's supposedly deep regret and guilt. Yes. Yeah. And then my thoughts, but here's my thoughts. Um, Cause it's a semicolon, right? In remorse, semicolon. The yeah. My thought is in, you know, very rarely is Nietzsche so simple and at face value, even as short aphorisms are, you know, they can pack quite a punch. Um, maybe even more so. I think maybe his best, I'll go ahead and put this out. His best work is probably his shortest stuff. His most direct, um, yes. You know, because the most direct is often the most, you know, at least in, in, in certain styles of writing, the most direct you can fit the most in, actually. You don't need all the window dressing and you don't need to uh, try to impress people or do what it often is that people do when they write. Um, and I want to say there's an aphorism either shortly before or after, which isn't included here, where he mentions that, like, you know, those who want to be under those who are profound, they speak directly. They they're they're letting you know, they're being un they, they, they actually, you know, they're wanting to be understood. And whereas those who actually aren't, you know, they do everything they can to take the appearance as of, as if, you know, and that's an aphorism, I want to say, you know, maybe it's 150 or 160 for all I know, but it's somewhere in the section of the gay science, somewhere not too far uh, above or below. But so my by, thought... um, So by inflexible, is he saying someone who is kind of short on time? that they're kind of busy all the time. They're kind of a, uh... well, the vert, the key words here are virtue time, different and honesty prevails. So if honesty is a virtue and the question would be, how would you classify honesty? Let's think about honesty here as the, just the strict Nietzschean sense of we're thinkers and we're philosophers and we're going, you know, everything's fair game, right? Everything goes under the microscope. Uh, we'll get to the bottom of it. We're not that mysterious. We are mythological. Yes. We're not that mysterious. Uh, back to the analytical thinking uh, that uh, we've learned too much. Okay. You know, so uh, within that context, my thoughts are, you know, this is a Socrates in his distance. He was inflexible to the very end, right? To the point of you can put me to death for it. That's inflexibility. That's inflexibility is a virtue. That is a strict no, no, no. Like he saw the, the what was happening around him and he's like, okay, I'm going in this direction and I'm going to take these people with me. And then he set out to do his work and he, he maintained his distance throughout it to the very end. Not once did he really let them celebrate him. And that was in, you know what I mean? That, that was, that yes. was, in, that was intelligent in him. And Nietzsche actually, Okay, the, 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 I don't want to get off too on too on a tangent, but there's this whole like this opens up like we do a podcast on this alone. It's such a very un unapparent and, and fascinating side of the human psyche and these yes, uh, aspects is. of this all. Um, but my thoughts are the remorse here is actually the conditions of things around him. That's okay. actually the remorse, because 
why, why then this inflexibility? Why can't he just play the game? Why can't he just go along with the psychodrama? Like why, why stop things at the door? As you mentioned earlier in uh, the most influential person, the fact that a person resists the whole spirit of his age stops it at the door and calls it to account, right? There's this line in the beginning of the gay science where Nietzsche says something along the lines of, you know, this is what we observe most. You look around and you go, wait a minute, you guys are doing all these measurements and calculations of what's going on. And you think, you know, what's happening, but these aren't the proper amounts. These aren't the right measures. You guys aren't valuing everything properly. You're not taking what needs to be taken into account. You know, the whole book really is shot through with uh, this line of thought um, on just what this mediation between individual and masses has been over time. Yeah. And also just scream self-reliance. Yes. Very much this uh, this aphorism uh, is on the self relying man. The my thoughts are that remorse to even be in a position to perceive it is the price to be paid for that inflexibility. You know, and that that inflexibility speaks to the harmful truth. But then there's a question: by the time you're pulling out the harmful truth, it's like, well, why was that necessitated? You know, we could have just we could have just slept along, believe you know, we could have crept and slept along, believing in gods as innocently as we could you know, and taking things as simply and drunkly as we could, right? Just stumbling down, like, what's, what's, what's the invention of nuclear uh, warfare, right? Like, uh, we could just continue on like that, right? We don't, we don't need to think about anything. It just happens on its own volition, let's say. And we could continue on like that, you know, in perpetuity, because we have, and it, it's not going to change, uh, you know, in any measure. Um, it seems the best we can do is have stop gaps in mediating, not just the suffering, but the volatility of those forces. Hmm. You know, this, uh, so, you know, that's uh, the painful truth. That's a man's yeas and nays. Uh, this aphorism itself, uh, it concerns itself with the lying spirit of the decadent uh, age and the declining empire. You know, you could think of uh, Emerson talking about speaking the rude truth. You know, especially earlier on in the essays when he's like, say to your brothers, say to your wives, say to your children, you know, like you deceivers, you know, that kind of thing. Like it, it really is a. Um... Well, it's At all that about point... kind of standing up for yourself and having courage to be honest, having the courage to be inflexible. Right. Well, it's a healthy instinct uh, yeah. that now that now uh, it, it, it now arises because of the need going, okay, well, this is, you know, you recognize what sickness is, you know? So um, like culture generally teaches the opposite of self-reliance precisely because it needs to teach you the individual how to fit in and to get along with the rest of the masses. And uh, mostly it's those at the top, the larger rules, regulations, and kind of, uh, you know, systems you have to be fit within it's so that you can get along and all that, you know, this entire process doesn't share a language is facilitated by language. Language itself is a reflection of the natural world. Uh, you know, and that's while, you know, we esteem that at our own expense and Emerson's words is, you know, man is a God in runes, a follower and a dwarf. Once upon a time, we did do the naming, you know, uh, this process of civilization of domestication, it's in fact to make you dependent to make you beholden, it's to make you chained, it's to make you fettered, it's to not make you free. In fact, it's like, uh, to contrast, the most dangerous thing for a society is a free man, a free agent, or a mass of free men. Think of a, think of a large mass of, um, what do you call it, uh, unemployed men. It's the worst thing you could have uh, any civ in any civilization. Yes. <laughs> because a large mass of discontent men, it's like that's the for those are the forces that literally destroy empires, right? Yes, it is. You know, uh, got me thinking, you know, I, I was wondering about that. I thought mean, of, about the, uh, the Roman Empire. Remember when I, I, right. I mentioned a gladiator to you? Yes. Yeah, and uh, they so like he just hosts like 150 days of games, right? And and maybe that's it. By the time you're putting a man like Maximus in chains himself, you know your civilization has jumped the shark. It's like, wait yeah. a minute, this guy shouldn't be down there in the Colosseum. He should be leading the nation of Rome. Instead, yeah. he, you know, at least in context of the character and temperament and strength and of those men in that story, right? Uh, just taking it like we're treating Gladiator right now. Is if that was all true, Joaquin Phoenix was the, Ro the emperor of Rome, uh, <laughs> you know, no, he, and he was under, uh, was it, uh, was it Marcus Aurelius? Yes. Yeah. Right. It was, was my father. 
Right. And uh, he, 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 he smothered him to death with the pillow, right? Yeah, um, I'm not sure how he actually died, but in the movie, he yeah, kind of yeah, just, like, it's, yeah, smothered it's him like with part his of the stomach. Drama. It's fine. Yeah, I'm not, but I know that's like that part's actually like true, isn't it? That the Marcus Aurelius was like killed by his son or something. Uh, I, that you one, I don't, that one, that one, I don't remember. I don't know. I guess I, don't I, if I, I, I guess I could honestly fact check it super quick right now. That's ah, fine. No, don't, don't worry about it. All right, uh, all right. <laughs> other p- people not to use Google. Uh, yeah. True. So this chaining, this dependency of culture, it is protection. It creates limitations and pressures within not just you, but the culture as a whole. You know, and this, this is, this divide, this emerges from, let's say, the people, their taste, their ethics, their morals as window dressing. And then also more importantly, their animal nature, right? Their biology, their temperament as that plays out, you know, um, but these forces don't guarantee that something great will be forged just because two forces go at each other. To, like, you know, in, in compete when rivals compete, both of them might be destroyed. Let's say that is a very real possibility that a lot of people don't like to think about. You know, a lot of people like to think like, oh, you can win every battle. And it's like, that's a very naive thought. If that's how yeah. you approach life, you know, uh, that this, this goes back to the first aphorism we read that life is far more dangerous than people realize, you know, uh, culture and the safety of the headspace that allows us is what protects us like we're like we're like children who don't realize the monsters are real yes. you know or the or we're children you know maybe that's what we have a good way of putting it um so uh let's see or it's mistaking sort of, the uh the snakes for sticks right yes yes that too no and and, and you know it's it's involu- it's it's mo- largely involuntarily it's because it's largely unconscious you know you can think of the imprisonment of an animal in a zoo when i say unconscious i mean that animals aren't exactly cognizant of the full scale of their prisoner conditions and you know sure you're an animal in captivity uh, you're out of your natural habitat, subject to all manners of, you know, depredating forces and behaviors. They definitely look depressed. Wild. So. Yeah. I mean. But, you know, at the very least, <laughs> they can survive. They can eat three times yeah. a day. Yeah. And, you know, at least if we're a little bit more complex animals, we can imagine ourselves happy and safe and console ourselves with thought like, you know, what mm-hmm. business is, is it of mine that, you know, some animals retain or even demand their freedom? You know, I remember I remember hearing uh over to a friend's house, you know, you're hearing, hearing the, the dogs and the coyotes over the valley at night, you know, and my thoughts are, you know, there those dogs are, you know, defending their territory and the coyotes are chattering back. And it's like, well, to the, the coyotes, a free agent, the dogs don't realize that they're subjects, right. You know, but what do they care? They're fed and they're happy. Yeah. You know, so there's, there's the difference in man, you know, can they be happy? Uh, so all these thoughts that might be extreme, but my thought is we can prove these claims that culture is dependence and worse, that it intentionally instills weakness. And I think it's because honesty and self-reliance and power in the old Christian and Western world, they were and they remain seen as violent and dangerous potential, right? They're usually to be snuffed out, to be attacked. Any divergence for centuries and millennia was attacked ruthlessly, right? You know, and mostly because these forces are dangerous, right? Anything that opposes you is a potential danger. You know, in this, in terms of culture, this is to be beaten out reliably over time, you know, and inevitably you create an an individual sense of an injustice. And maybe that applies to an entire collective or just an individual. But the point is, is that this very shaping of forces over time has given birth to the individual in the West, the very concept of it, you know, and the notion is that if we look at history, it's like, and especially in the Nietzschean sense, as he writes himself, that the individual arises as a force, you know, he's basically a tyrannical force of history. He arises out of, you know, we remember him because he was a powerful enough force to be remembered. You know, yeah. whether it's a Caesar or a Napoleon, it was the conditions of the time that produced him, you know, and that was one force in relation to another. So uh, within the larger zeitgeist, you know, it really is uh, to bring people to heal, you know, and that coercion of culture is in fact an act of violence, but then in turn, the notion of self-reliance in the individual to, tr- to, to, to be able to actually do that, to absolve one's to oneself in the Nietzschean or the Emersonian sense uh, to, or to carry about like a Socrates or a Nietzsche, that is also an act of violence. Yeah, because like your uh, your existence is almost a, it's almost kind of a 
rebellion against every single force that is trying to keep you down. Inflexibility, right? Yeah. This goes back to earlier. That's the inflexibility. And well, the inflexibility is required because you realize how much you have to say no. You realize how half-baked the ideas are here, how half-baked the people are here, right? Like, again, it's like, you're going to take advice from a drunk person? Or are you going to, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, in, 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 things like that. Like, I could, you know, or if your society is sick, you know, are you just fitting into, is fitting into that healthy? You know, I could, I could, or even if you're like, we could even say, never mind the society, if your family's sick, if you recognize that your family is you know, weird and crazy and difficult or whatever the case may be. Maybe, maybe the cops have paperwork on them, maybe not. But if you realize these things, you know, it's like you realize like, oh, you know, these tyrannizing forces aren't what I thought they were, you know, or I guess, you know, it depends on what your perception of them were and how much they shaped you. Because if they instilled enough fear and awe, then, you know, maybe, maybe you're hooked for a lifetime. Now, maybe you're yeah. a, uh, you know, thoroughly broken human being for lifetime Hmm. and i'm not saying that cynically to say culture is supposed to break people because you know it's a matter of art um, art and vision you know and you think about i brought up the example to you last time i asked you something like you know let's say you're a young teenager greg and you get home late at night past the agreed curfew and you know your dad your dad sees that you're acting kind of shifting he goes what's that in your hand and you know it's in his interest to know because Maybe, maybe you just have some drugs in your hand or maybe you went out and stole a bunch of ammo because you're going to shoot up a school because, you know, whatever, right? Like there's a huge discrepancy there, but you can see your father's concern regardless. Both are of concern to him because, you know, he's concerned about your health and well-being, which means he's not, which is a healthy instinct because he's synonymous. He's actually also identifying there. The survival of you is also the survival of him, right? Um, the evolutionary sense and the biological sense of the reproduction of genes is like key in us. It's huge. Right. Um, Yes. You know, all all the, all the, the crying out against reproduction and things like that, it really is a sign of, of the decay in in, in the times um, that people think it's a bad thing. And it's like, and I guess to the degrees you could say overpopulation is a problem insofar as we throw again, that it's largely a sleeping process that humanity and mass for the most part, throws its children for even though we don't think we reproduce like insects in a very real sense we do kind of throw our children blindly forward right we don't necessarily think like we 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 shunt them to fit in without really concern with maybe fitting in is the worst thing that i could do to this kid in this whether it's in this scenario or this situation or maybe even as a whole you know like maybe maybe it's better to homeschool your child, let's say, in the current yeah. day and age. Things like that come to mind, you know, with how poor our education system is and how terrible it's been for so long. Well, um, and the you, thing about um, overpopulation like if, is that it, uh, it corrects itself over time. Um, once yes. Shit hits oh, the yeah. So. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 So. 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 There. Again. There. there there's. There's whether we like the methods or not nature has like protection mechanisms built in every step of the way you know just yeah so the process can continue you know like nature's like we don't want these drunkards to sober up they need to keep procreating right that's one take on it you could say yeah all uh, right like so long as the intoxication remains then the orgy can continue you know um that that stroke of genius um let's say in the Greeks, right? Like that was, that was an instinct towards health. That was an instinct towards art to keep the dream going. You know, what happens when the dream breaks down? It's like, well, you need a new dream. You need a better dream. If you realize your old dream was a lie or not what you thought it was, that's a serious problem, let's say, right? Again, you need to reinvent yourself. You need to recreate yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of just what it's, I, well, that's just what it's all about as far as the whole essay goes, um, creating yourself. I used to like tell people, and I still tell people this, that um, a lot of people kind of confuse meditation with this thing where you're supposed to dissolve yourself and destroy yourself, right? And But at the point where you destroy yourself, I mean, that's when you start to create, right? You start to uh, create a new self. You start right. to create, or you start to become what you are, what you've always. Well, I don't. I, I don't want to uh, to reduce it down to saying, you know, like the 
the beginning is in fact the ending or the you know but again this is this is ancient this is heraclitus this is buddha this is Nietzsche, right like man is yeah. down going and, and up going you know it's the same as the first is the same as last how we just read the same thing from emerson himself you know it's yes. it's the theme repeats it's always relevant um it's not that you destroy your sight. It's like, okay, you know, at the end, at the, at the end of possibility lies new potential, you know, if that possible yes. one possibility is dead, then another one arises. Um, so this was getting into, uh, if you remember, you said dis- discontent is the want of self-reliance, um, you know, and this is the herd, this is the mass man's confession, right? Because you would think after thousands of years of civilization that they'd ever be happy or content. You see that and it just doesn't happen that way. You know, discontent is the is the one to the herd. They're never happy. Um, you know, it's like how many revolutionary masses? How many more aims? How many? How much more freedom can mankind want? Hmm. You know, and then because because well, here's in you know, and, and and I'll get to the crux of the the, the problem here. You know, it's it's because that discontent is the antipode of self-reliance, because imagine if you were happy with yourself, Greg, you know, how could advertisers get you to buy? How could a politician win your vote? How could a herd of mass minded people and their shallow, idiotic opinions sway you at all? I'm not Answer, sure they can't and they won't. You know, you, you you will have been too inflexible in your resolve, let's say. I don't know how you got there. But remember, you talk about looking forward to whatever future Greg has to offer or has, you know, and, you know, I mean, I guess what I think have to has to offer, I mean, for you, to you. Um, I'm not thinking of you as a function of the herd um, because we could. And then we know what the, you know, if I if I think of you as a function of the herd, it reminds me of just anything Christian, anything American to the degrees I could say, Oh, of course, because, you know, you're a good guy and you're out there doing good guy things. And, uh, you know, it's for the good of everybody. And, you know, we justify it all, you know, whatever it is you do, we will justify it all day and night up and down just on that premise alone. Yep. And they'll justify their way straight to hell. Yeah. Uh, to the there and back again, <laughs> but I mean, that cover covers a lot of the sentiments here. Uh, yeah. You know, I guess, you know, last I'll say is this. Uh, so in, in light of you mentioning to me, like going like, Hey, I think this, I think the self-reliant guy, you know, guy who wrote self-reliance, you think he's talking to you, right? You think yeah. you realize that he's not nec- like Nietzsche, he's not necessarily concerned with the marketplace and that sort of thing. He's actually speaking directly to you. You know, um, I, I sent you that song by all them, witches. I think it's called like three, five, nine. Yeah. Uh, because in that song, he says, I'm becoming increasingly aware of the invisible hand uh, or the invisible spoon plate in the feeding hand, you know, and that song is, you know, as far as I can tell, it's an artist recognizing who feeds him, who brings home the paycheck, you know, as a child, you look around and you feel hapless and helpless before these forces. And then as you begin to mature and make your way in this world, you know, whether you consciously realize it or not, you're the one doing the actions. You're the one putting in the work. And at what point is it enough that you get to say to yourself, like, hey, it's in fact, it's not these other people feeding me. It's not these other people whom I owe. Who is it then? You know, what really is that invisible hand? What really is in that invisible spoon? And what really is that invisible plate? You know, who's setting, who's setting the meal? Who's feeding you? Yeah, well, feed. it's it's kind of a conglomerate of forces, and in the end, especially as far as like the things that make you you, is kind of just a conglomerate of forces, a conglomerate of wills. Right, but I was thinking specifically, it was the artist recognizing that you know if the if there's any real magic in this, it's him. Like yes. it's not, it's not coming from the outside. You know, he's yes, the yes. artist. It's his vision. Um, he's the one feeding himself, you know, and, and I liken it to childhood because I just think it's a good example, right? That if you can imagine your consciousness at, at age five to age 10 to age 20, you know, all these things moving upward, uh, how much not just your perception changed and what you could even see and how you could measure and understand, 
you know, you become more cognizant of the forces. And, you know, as a child, you know, you might, in a sense, you might as well be a dog, you know, masters up in the morning and magically food appears in your bowl. Like, you know, yes. the, the dog assumes you hunted it, I guess. Right. Like <laughs> what, what does the dog think? I don't know, but he assumes you went out and killed something and turned it into kibble sized bits, which is relatively true to the degree we put like food proteins and stuff in dog food, you yes. know, like the leftover animal remnants um, from the factory farms. So um, there's that. Shit, so the, dog's not, the dog wouldn't be wrong. Yeah. Shit, I'm not gonna try a cat food anymore. Right. So, but there's one last thing here. Uh, you know, yeah, my thoughts are this: that if you really are trying to absolve yourself to yourself, you know, Emerson offers you two methods. He says there's the direct way in which you do, uh, you complete your duties, and then there's the reflex that's absolving yourself to yourself. You know, and you'll know you'll know when you're at a position, you know, certain positions there in this kind of like navigating that labyrinth because it's no different than that to the degrees that those around you, they're going to attempt to bring you back in. If they see too much deviation in you, I promise you, like you, you can run this experiment time and time again with people and their ideas and their cultures. And I'm not saying you should be a shit to people and like, you know, manipulate. I'm just saying you can run the experiment and see how much rope people will give you to wonder before they start saying no come back before you weird me out too much or before you scare me right um yeah that that very notion you know this is culture is the domesticating thus unifying force you know it's a force that eliminates its competition and its threats and this has long been culture's goal so it masquerades its goal as something else like it could be a manifest destiny or it could be progressivism or quote unquote progress, right? Because if this is progress, that's hilarious. You know, uh, then why is everyone so unhappy if we've become so progressive? It makes no sense. Like, none, like you can't actually, like none of the logic there and makes sense, but we are. Well, they that. forget that, uh, that suffering is an inevit inevitable part of life. And it's not only an inevitable part of life, but it's a crucial part of life in order to grow. Yes, yes, uh, that's important, right? Uh, and then in terms of how these things differ, you know, diverging forces, diverging people, um, you know, my thoughts are, you know, so, so how, how can you be accepted if you diverge? Because then it's like, okay, imagine two people in a relationship, guy and a girl, and they're both drug addicts. Imagine one of them gets sober. How hard is that relationship going to be to maintain if the one person yeah. wants to maintain their sobriety and the other person wants to maintain their high? Right. Like, or similarly, uh, two people uh, are obese. One loses a lot of weight, wants to stay healthy. The other one gets fatter. Right. You see this, this is diverging interest here. This is competing forces. Now imagine your entire culture is a drug addict, Greg, or an obese slob. My question would be what measure of health is it to adjust yourself to that in any manner? If there are, if everyone's lying, what measure of health is to justify yourself that to any manner? especially in a culture that supposedly values truth or honesty well, or morality the, and virtue in the first place. I and I don't mean that in a cheap gotcha way because I get it that like to me, hypo hypocrisy means nothing like that. Let me clear the air real quick. Yeah. Hypocrisy is just, uh, it's, it's, it's a remainder of uh, Ar Aranius logical Christian metaphysical moral logic. That's all hypocrisy ever is. It's just a remainder from a nonsensical value system to begin with. I mean, not that the import of the value system is nonsensical, but that the values assigned therein, i.e. good, bad, that that all remains nonsensical because you can never actually justify or rationalize it because you always get the remainder of hypocrisy. So let's, we're completely throwing away hypo the concept of hypocrisy. It doesn't exist to us, right? Hypocrisy is like Christianity or God itself. Like hypocrisy died with Christianity as far as I'm concerned, right? It died with God. Or, you know, it died with Nietzsche's critique of Western culture. Yeah. So we can throw that concept out. Now, if I didn't derail you too much, go on with your, uh, your, your comment or your question. Yeah, I was just going to say that... Um... As far as living in a culture of dishonesty, I think it goes further and further than that. The root cause of being a dishonest culture is being a culture that shoves suffering to the side and tries to avoid it or covers it up with like drugs, with alcohol, um, with just like pure acts of avoidance away from suffering, away from confrontation, throwing on masks, throwing on lies and deceit and 
throwing yourself into like anchoring, throwing yourself into isolation, like throwing yourself in all of these uh, ways that uh, uh, the Zap talks about, like just like anchoring yourself to a cause like that, like in a sense, you're lying. You're trying to cover up like this deep bit of fear towards something very, very terrible called death that you're just like throwing a blanket over and then you write like God on it. <laughs> right. 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 And um, then within that, you can stumble like a drunk. Right. And then luckily yeah. you get back up and you're protected within that. No, uh, very, very astute. Uh, very good. Um, it's very on point uh, to the, to the matters at hand. And let's see, I, cause I think that about covers it for the Nietzsche notes. Um, yeah. Nietzsche. I mean, he talks about this, like just ripping off that blanket. Right. Uh, Emerson's yeah. just like pull off the blanket pull right. off the mask and there's and and you know and it's not to be confused because i there's definitely you know there's a like nietzsche talks about like there's certain old maids and doddering fools where it's just like you know let 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 them be happy in their dream right let them be happy in their like you know to to to, to go around yeah. just stomping on people sandcastles it's like well one it doesn't take a very big man to do that let's say right it's not yeah. impressive <laughs> like i think i mentioned this to you before right to the degrees that uh, us modern Westerners can all be cynics and critical. It's like, it's not that impressive, right? Like we have a, we have a, uh, yeah. uh, what do you call it? A tradition that goes back thousands of years. And it's like, you know, I, like I said, if I don't see a single Diogenes, you know, I'm not impressed, uh, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> better, better, stronger men have existed. So it's like, until you see someone who actually, you know, hits that or tops that it's, 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 again, it's hard to be impressed. Uh, that doesn't mean I can't be in awe of men right? It just means that I understand how rare it is. And the coolest thing is like with that note, I think uh, Emerson's really going to get into that here. Um, Do you want to take us off with where we left off? And did you want to recap a little bit higher up than? um, Yeah, yeah. I'll start with uh, if our young men. Sure. Yeah. It's kind of where we left off. Okay. We're on page 15, halfway through on that math.dartmouth.edu link that's in the description. If our young men miscarry in their first enterprises, they lose all heart. If the young merchant fails, men say he is ruined. If the finest genius studies at one of our colleges and is not installed in an office within one year afterwards in the cities or suburbs of Boston or New York, it seems to his friends and to himself that he is right in being disheartened and in complaining the rest of his life. A sturdy lad from New Hampshire or Vermont who in turn tries all the professions, who teams it, farms it, peddles, keeps a school, preaches, edits a newspaper, goes to Congress, buys a township, and so forth in successive years, and always like a cat falls on his feet, is worth a hundred of these city dolls. He walks abreast with his days and feels no shame in not studying a profession, for he does not postpone his life, but lives already. He has not one chance, but a hundred chances. Let a stoic open the resources of a man, of man, and tell men they are not learning willows, but can and must attach themselves. That with the exercise of self-trust, new powers shall appear. That a man is the word made flesh, born to shed healing to the nations. That he should be ashamed of our compassion. And that the moment he acts from himself, tossing the laws, the books, idle trees, and customs out of the window. We pity him no more, but thank and revere him. And that teacher shall restore the life of man to splendor and make his name dear to all of history. See, so this is why Emer- Nietzsche says we lost a philosopher in Emerson. Yeah. Emerson's a philosopher's philosopher. Like you've heard the concept comedians, comedian and things like that. And yeah, you know, it's usually just a way of saying they're better than everybody else. Yeah. It's like <laughs> Emerson was too like almost like Nietzsche. Uh, Emerson was too good to concern himself with the marketplace. And, you know, do we, he, he, he was thinking in terms of, again, the shapers and uh, speaking kind of directly, you know, I guess. And again, back to the notion of self-reliance, you know, it precludes, it precludes a lot of philosophy to the degree that philosophy also addresses the masses. You know what I mean? That yes. if, 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 you, if you're to organize and systematize a people and a culture to have an art and a vision. Um, so there, there, there was a thought in here, though, that it struck me the most on this read through. Yeah. Not that, not that he said men are not leaning willows. Uh, 
must detach themselves that that with the existence of self-trust, new power shall appear. See, that's important because like if you actually, if you're familiar with any of the science on like modern neuroticism, and I mean that seriously, like, I mean, modern panic attacks and PTSD and all, and so many different things, uh, these yes. kind of more modern forces are that at least appear more regularly in the modern age. Cause again, we could look back in history and say a lot of these psychological conditions existed. They just call them different things or whatever yeah. the case was, uh, we're talking about the proliferation and, um, you know, large amounts of people means large amounts of illness. So, you know, that, you know, the notion within psychological treatment is that you have the resources inside you, but it's a matter of getting you to see them, understand them and utilize them, you know, but people go at great lengths to avoid things they should do, things they need to do, you name it, right? Like if we're talking about to a, to a drug addict, let's say, then being sober would be a need because otherwise, you know, it's uh, unless they want to die, I suppose, right? And if the will is that uh, lax therein, then it's just aimed downward, right? Because uh, it'll, it'll, it'll destroy itself before it does nothing at all, right? Is uh, uh, Nietzsche 101, I suppose. Um, and you, you see it bears out, yes, uh, in, in, in modern people and depressed people and all that stuff. Uh, it seems lacking I've a purpose. Seen it. Yes. Okay, good, good, good. Yes. Uh, I think most uh, most anyone listening probably has too. I've even seen, uh, seen it. They myself. would not be, they would, so. yes. Yeah. And we, and, and no one would be here listening if they didn't see and understand it, at least in a certain capacity. Let's see. So, but that's the thought. How could, how could you ever learn to trust yourself? when we've been teaching you to be dependent and codependent the entire time, you know, yes. the moment, if you start to spread out too far on your own and I say, Hey, no, come back, Greg, you're, you're getting too far out there. Like I'm getting worried about, you know, your thinking is not right any longer or your yes. beliefs aren't correct. Cause it's a really weird thing to think about just that if you diverge just hardly from those around you who believe something similar, how much they might, how much alienation or trouble you risk in going against them. Well, that's like uh, in uh, Life of Brian. You've seen that, right? Yeah, been a while, but yes. Yeah, that's like when the, the Judea's people front are saying that there's no one they hate more than the Romans, than the, uh, than the people's front of Judea. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, like when you like slightly divert off, uh, people get pissed off. Mm-hmm. Right. Because like, why, you you know, we had things organized a specific way. And here you came along messing with everything. Yeah. You know, and, and Emerson, and I, I love it that Emerson says it so directly uh, earlier on in the essay when he says something like, you know, um, uh, something, you know, uh, that something new might make the past look shabby. Right. Like it might, you know, you can do good, but don't do too good because then you'll make us look lazy or bad. Right. Yes. It's why there's competition you could say in so much of business and other practices, because in life, despite our masks of civility and that weakness that you were talking about earlier, because that's the word that popped into my mind, what you were talking about there when you laid all that out earlier, that was, you were describing weakness, you were describing sickness, you were describing pathology, right? Yes. Um, and to me, that's the big, the, the honesty is saying, oh, it is in fact a competition, you know? And if people can't play that game, then that has to be okay too. Because if not, then you're going to disrupt the entire game. So, so the imaginary players who never stood a chance to begin with can stand a chance, like, right? That game does not follow. No one's going to want to play that game. Yes. Not, not all people are meant for all games. No, I am terrible at Monopoly. <laughs> and just, just terrible. Just terrible. Um, I'll go ahead and read this next, this next one. Sure. It is easy to see that a greater self-reliance must work a revolution in all the offices and relations of men, in their religion, in their education, in their pursuits, their modes of living, their association, in their property, in their speculative views. Hmm. Right. So, again, this reminds me of Nietzsche saying we, we, we lost a philosopher there and because you know, this, if, if this is his ideal, he's putting forth, you know, who's he really speaking to, uh, especially when the whole thing's counterintuitive, um, you know, it might as well, to a certain degree, it might as well be Diogenes recommending every, you know, here, you put your barrel here. Um, yes. You can say well, it's he, quite the ideal. Oh, go on. He's kind of like speaking to like, you know, don't, he, 
he's talking about a revolution within yourself, right? Yes. And about like breaking free. And you have to do that, not just because like you could go and be more self-reliant at work and then not do any of that anywhere else, right? You could be more self-reliant with your friends and not do that anywhere else, right? right. Um, you're, you're still kind of, you're still repressed. You're still hiding under that blanket. Right. um you're still hiding from the light right right because it, yeah it's not just in all offices it's in the relations of men in yeah the religion in their education in their pursuits their mode of living their association their property their speculative views yes right uh public opinion it's like why is why is the age of public why is the age of public opinion the age of private laziness it's because when you take your all your cues to the, from the herd you know then there's nothing to it you actually didn't do anything you didn't you know Yes. You, you were taught how to think and now you're doing as you were told, right? That's yes. weakness. That's sickness. That's decadence, you know? Uh, so I guess we're, 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 we're getting, and he's going to address this shortly too. So before I go off on a tangent, let's keep reading. Uh, <laughs> right. So he's got some numbers here. Yeah. So I'm not sure if the numbering can, Oh yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. There's a huge, yeah. Oh, yeah. all right. One, in what prayers do men allow themselves? That which they call a holy office is not so much as brave and manly. Prayer looks abroad and asks for some foreign addition to come through some foreign virtue and loses itself in endless mazes of natural and supernatural and mediatorial and miraculous. Prayer that craves a particular commodity, anything less than all good, is vicious. Prayer is a contemplation of the facts of life from the highest points of view. It is a soliloquy, 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 of, soliloquy of a beholding and jubilant soul. It is the spirit of God pronouncing His works good, but prayer as a means to effect a private end is mean it is meanness and theft. It supposes dualism and not unity in nature and consciousness. As soon as the man is at one with God, he will not beg. He will then see prayer in all action. The prayer of the farmer kneeling in his field to weed it. The prayer of the rower kneeling with the stroke of his oar. As true prayers heard throughout nature, through the cheap ends. Care attack in Flet Fletcher's Bonduca, when admonished to inquire the mind of the god Adaic replies his hidden meaning lies in our endeavors our valors are our best gods yeah he he's speaking to the best kind of prayer is just doing it yourself yeah i, I, I like well i'd say one of the biggest things in here especially after two thousand years of western religion and philosophy is that you know, without even any explanation or, you know, because he could, you could write essays on this line right here. It supposes dualism and not unity in nature and consciousness. I love that because it, go, it goes against, again, thousands of years of supposition that we are in fact not a unity in the sense that we are a spirit that's going to wing free of this body that I think therefore, right, this is, you know, this dualism goes back a long ways and you can trace its lineage yes. over, you know, time. And that he just completely throws it out without explanation. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, yes. It's, it's the biggest thing in this section here. Um, you know, it's very, it's quite Greek. It's quite Eastern. It's quite, you know, it, you, you could almost, you could, that, that even that, like, you know, the, the prayer of the farmer kneeling in his field, you know, that, that's, that's a very Eastern notion. And you could say it's also romantic and poetic. Yeah. And I guess if you wanted to criticize, you could say maybe Emerson's being good at comforting, maybe he's comforting himself a bit much here, but I don't think that that's not the purpose to which he writes. Yeah. This um, could, well, this kind of goes back to, uh, I don't know if you've watched. Even or, though he's a master of prose. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. sure if you've listened to, uh, the Nietzsche podcast, the episode where he talks about the sacredness of the body. Yes. No, that's, that's, that's probably one of my favorites because it's one of the least it's for being one of the most important aspects to life period. It's one of the least addressed and most avoided. And yes. I think it's because again, so much of our consciousness and our perspective is shaped more, even if we don't think we're 
generally speaking, I mean, Westerners, uh, Americans, you name it. Yes. Um, even if they go, okay, I'm not Christian. I don't believe in an afterlife. So much of our language, even so, like the way people speak is like, there is an eye that is separate from the body, right? That's, that's usually how we speak, right? It's yeah. very endemic to who and what we are. Uh, very like mm-hmm. to think of yourself as an, just it, no different than a dog, just an animal in the moment, right? right. That's a very different thing. Um, than this me that's going to exist today, tomorrow, and then possibly in the hereafter. Yes. And even if I don't believe in God and an afterlife, I still often speak in it and act as if there are two separate parts of me, like the lower part of me, the body, and then there's some yes. theoretical higher part, you know? Um, I, I love it that he throws it out right here. And that again, no explanation. It's like, whoa, that is, that's incredible. You know, he did, this is like, this is like Nietzsche's approach to God and religion of just, you know, it's just not even a question, right? We're not even going to waste yes. our time because there's more important things to discuss, in fact, mm-hmm. and to look into. Similar here. So it supposes dualism and not unity in nature and consciousness. Uh, the fact that, uh, that there even can be a, a unity, let's say. Yeah. So, and then, then, then there's, uh, and then, you know, and then you question, okay, how, how far does that unity extend? You know, yeah. uh, the, the tradition has been to try to expand that to everyone. You know, what we see over time is that doesn't work too well. Uh, cult, culture, but again, culture can't, culture couldn't deny itself because what else can it do? You know, it's like, we don't expect, if we, if we mentioned earlier that part of the weakness was this kind of a, this confessional nature, this, uh, what do you call it? This, um not just the the the, conf- the confessions of it all or the uh what do you call it the rationalizations the justifications the disclaimers the expl- you know explain yourself greg let's yeah. say uh that kind of thing well i didn't mean to right and it's like let me hear if you have a good enough excuse and then what's the point <laughs> of that because you yeah. might have a good excuse and what if i'm what if i'm just an asshole and i'm like well that's not good enough for me then i really need to think of how i'm going to punish you right this is how punishment and cruelty work <laughs> Yeah. It's just funny that, you know, uh, so much of so-called correcting behavior is just cr- punishment and cruelty. A lot of the times, like, you're not correcting a behavior at all because technically there's nothing incorrect in there. You just don't like it, let's say, or maybe you're averse to it, or maybe you do see something bad in it. Like, if it's clearly harmful, maybe it is. Have you ever played Grand Theft Auto V? Nope. So there's this uh, scene in there where you're, you're playing as Trevor. He's kind of like the most, like, uh, irreverent dude. Mm-hmm. And you have to torture this dude for the CIA. And then, then you're, you're torturing him and the guy tells you what he wants. And then Trevor's like, oh yeah, I mean, I don't really care about uh, what you have to say. I just like torturing people. <laughs> and then, then he just goes ahead and continues torturing him. Yeah. Um, so a real like, American yeah. hero. And what people say, uh, it's never really good enough because. Uh, oh yeah, you see that in our politics issues. too, yeah. right? Like this is this is the point in moment, right? Like our polit- like politics, social media, you name it. It's just part of the zeitgeist at the moment. Yeah, it's very moral. It's and it's like the irony of a supposedly moral, progressive, accepting, loving people being oppressive, repressive. Uh, and then this is why I said earlier, you know, make sure you do away with the hypocrisy because it's not real. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's more like irony is the kind of thing you can point out to say, well, here's your kind of clue in as to what's really happening here yeah. and why it's happening. But it's besides the point, you know, it's not really because it's not like it's it's not like it's funny and it's not like it's intelligent. So it's just kind of like this low hanging thing um, of modern American politics and public opinion. Yes. Uh, you know, it's sickness is what it is. Right. And I wouldn't like, you know, for your own health, you know. Um, it's the it's the herd reliance epidemic. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, you know, when all when when, when uh, you know, Zap talks about this, too. Right. When, uh, yeah. when you have cultural revolutions is what happens. Uh, you know, anchors give out whole sections of the the mechanism like, you know, shatter or fall or, or spasm. Right. Uh, the, if maybe one of the outer ramp, you know, in terms of modern American politics, you would say a few of the outer rampart walls went down and maybe a few other ones went up. And, you know, how much does anyone see of it? It's like, well, uh, I can tell you not much. And it's like, how do I know? It's like, well, because no one's talking about it. No one's actually yeah. said it. Very few people actually do or address it in any meaningful manner other than outside of their left right divide and again the irony of a people supposedly free people supposedly brave people you know who are beholden to not just two choices uh 
politically, but in in most domains of life, period. But you know, nowadays it's, it seems seems to be pretty headed to be pretty monoculture because you know it's very you know. Uh, I guess the guise of it, you would say it's, it's very kind of the most shallow of cosmopolitan kind of like, you know, we are the evolved ones. It's like, if everyone's like a second rate Voltaire with a, um, like a second rate Voltaire, all the pity and compassion to boot with like, with enough Rousseauian revenge in them to really froth froth and foam. Yeah. It's like, that's American liberal decadence to the extreme. It's, it's very much an illness because, you know, once, once anything becomes too one-sided too too monotheistic, right. It falls. Yeah. Uh, Anything like, like a God can become all powerful, but then it's just the next biggest target, you know? Um, Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And again, maybe you welcome the challenge. I like the challenge. Good. We're in the, yeah, we're, we're in the right place then. Uh, shall we keep going? Yeah, I'm going to go use the restroom. Oh, yeah. yeah okay, we'll good, good call. Continue on a, on another sort of false prayers. Our valors are our best gods. Yep. So returning from the restroom break, I think I said before that go figure, you know, the last man might wind up living the longest can back right well um i didn't Anyways. see yeah and I, w- I was going somewhere with that I, I remember we were talking about uh not self-reliance um let's go let's uh i guess going ahead and go on with um our false prayers at, as our regrets yeah another sort of false prayers are our regrets discontent is the want of self-reliance it is infirmity of will Regret calamities. If you can thereby help the sufferer, if not, attend your own work, and already the evil begins to be repaired. Our sympathy is just as base. We come to them who weep foolishly and sit down and cry for company instead of imparting to them truth and health in rough electric shocks, putting them once more in communication with their own reason. The secret of fortune and joy in our hands Welcome evermore to gods and men is the self-helping man. For him, all doors are flung wide. Him, all tongues greet, all honors crown, all eyes follow with desire. Our love goes out to him and embraces him because he did not need it. We solicitously and apologetically caress and celebrate him because he held on his way and scorned our disapprobation. The gods love him because men hated him. To the preserving mortal, said Zoroaster, the blessed immortals are swift. So that's a so that's gladiator right there, with the uh, with uh, the gladiator right uh, Maximus and Marcus Aurelius's son. Uh, Marcus Aurelius's son is the guy who's not self reliant. Um, he depends on everyone. He depends on everyone for fame. Uh, he he doesn't stand up for himself, but the gladiator Maximus, he stands up for himself. Everyone loves him. Everyone praises him. Right, and he has um, the way, and he has no choice because he's a slave in the arena. Right, he's yes. he's fighting. He's fighting for his life. Yeah, like the like the fame and all that other stuff is incidental. Like, if anything, it's almost you know to to someone of his station. In fact, the whole thing's an insult. That's besides the point. Uh, he learn he learns to fight and to put on a show. Yes, at least in the context of the movie. Um, <laughs> yeah it's a good you know, ass it, movie good ass movie so to me I, I wrote up above you know this is the difference of scholars and great thinkers is the pro- yeah. pro- the profound effect or the lack of or retarding effect they have on their readers and followers you know there's a profound difference between being able to instantaneously give people something to reflect upon and to otherwise try to convince them or beg with them or plead them or you know inform them um you know, Emerson's yeah. intent, you know, that this uh, it's inspired, like it's more like Nietzsche's approach. It's very inspired, um, you know, to put them in communication with their own reason. It's like, well, why does Nietzsche give his readers such a good thrashing? It's like, this is why uh, health and rough electric shocks, putting them once more in communication with their own reason it is like Nietzsche saying, you know, life is li- you know, life is a problem again. You know, every everything like, you know, it, it, everything goes. It, it's all sanctioned. 
because yeah. now we are free to experiment. We are no longer chained like we were to the past, you know, or in, in, in another angle, you know, when he says all men who uh, to exist henceforth, you know, they're going to belong to a higher history. You know, I don't know that anyone makes much of a fuss about this or, you know, cause the way you, you might uh, take it, if you look at the headlines and look at what the culture's up to is like, you might think this is like the most boring apocalypse to ever happen, let's say, or the most, you know, yeah. uh, boring end of the world. You know what I mean? Like that's kind of the, you know, the, the direction versus, um, I don't know, I wouldn't say the intuitive approach, but kind of, um, Emerson says it here. The secret of fortune is joy in our hands. The secret of fortune is joy in our hands. See, this is having access to those resources within, you know, how can you learn to trust yourself? It's like, well, honestly, you kind of have to be forced and tested and, and, and beat up. Yes. You know, unfortunately you mentioned earlier the suffering, you know, to, I guess, to uh, what do you call it? To the, the word used is unfortunately, to the uh, sympathetic type, or I, maybe it's just considered good Christian taste, you know, oh, someone suffered. Oh, how terrible. You know, we don't really tell each other to suffer well or suffer better, or I wish you suffering, but you know, it, it I don't know. But we should. Make, yeah. It make, maybe it'd make for a better psychodrama, right? Maybe that's yeah. the, the exact uh, bit of artistic Im improvement uh, that our culture needs, you know, well, people may, need may, to embrace it. Yeah. Uh, like we, we need a new death God to worship, you know? Um, <laughs> um, well, welcome evermore to gods and men is a self-helping man for him all doors are flung wide i love this part right here uh our love goes out to him and embraces him because he did not need it this reminds like i can yes. think of a lot of this makes me think of at least a few nietzsche lines uh come to mind um along the lines of not it was just funny. He, he talks about us. I, I, can't, I can't remember off the top of my head, but he talks about, you know, very similar, not just uh, words, but the sentiments themselves. Um, that notion of not needing something, you know, this is, this is also offensive to people. Let's say it's not just that you're going off, you're going past the allotted lines of culture or family or otherwise. Um, it's not just that. Yeah. Right. It's that you back to, I think I said it earlier, uh, self-reliance is in fact an act of violence. Yes. Because if you, if you, if you were to go to your family and be like, you know what, I don't need you suckers. You know, you don't have to say suckers, but if you said, I don't need you guys, like that's just, you generally don't treat your loved ones like that. No, no. Right. There, there's probably, if you did need to express yourself, there's probably a better way to do it. That's going to communicate what you actually need to communicate. Let's say. Yes. Because you know, that's the question. It's like, well, you know, is anyone what's actually going on here? Is, does anyone want to be right about something or are they actually trying to understand? Yeah. You know, are they trying to or are they trying to um, better hone their vision or create an artistic vision? Uh, back to the other point. Well, you have to cut the umbilical cord, right? Mm -hmm. So sooner or later, sooner or later. Yep. Because otherwise you won't uh, you'll never gain access to those resources. So I was actually also thinking earlier when you mentioned uh, the act of rebellion, and it's funny because rebellion is rebellion until the system finally accepts it. And then it's no longer rebellion. And then it's yeah. like, okay, well, so is the system a rebel now? And it's like, no, the system can never be a rebel. Yeah. The system well, can like only make hipster, allowances. That's like the hipster syndrome, right? What's that? Um, just like a hipster but they like bring up like, oh, new things. It's like, it's like a hippie becoming a corporate yuppie kind of thing. Yeah. Like that, that whole thing of how, how the cultures go for a full circle. Don't worry. Some of us are actually like, some of us remain belligerent, violent people. Like it's, yes. it's, it's all good. Um, uh, in, what's the word he uses? Inflexibility. That's the word. So some of us remain inflexible. Uh, it's not just a passing fad or a dream state. That's the difference, I would say. Yeah. Um, uh, or it's just one more thing to follow, maybe. As, okay, I'll, I'll read the next part. It's cool. Just, Go for it. Just to keep it moving here. I think, well, I think we had some more notes, but yeah, let's keep it moving. As men's prayers are a disease of the will, so are their, or the, so are their creeds a disease of the intellect. They say with those foolish Israelites, let not God speak to us lest we die. Speak thou, speak any man with us, and we will obey. 
Everywhere I am hindered of meeting God and my brother because he has shut his own temple doors and recites fables merely of his brothers or his brother's brother's God. Every new <laughs> mind is a new class. That's pretty good, right? Every new mind is a new classification. If it prove a mind of uncommon activity and power, a lock, a levisier, a hutton, a bentham, a foyer, it imposes its classification on other men and lo, a new system. In proportion to the depths of the thought and so to the number of the objects it touches and brings within reach of the pupil in his complacency. But chiefly is this apparent in a, but chiefly is this apparent in creeds and churches, which are also classifications of some powerful mind acting on the elemental thought of duty and man's relation to the highest, such as Calvinism, Quakerism, Swedenborgism. The pupil takes the same delight in subordinating everything to the new terminology as a girl who has just learned botany and is seeing a new earth and new seasons thereby. It will happen for a time that the pupil will find his intellectual power has grown by the study of his master's mind. But in all unbalanced minds, the classification is idolized, passes for the end, and not for a speedily exhaustible means. I'm going to pause right here. It's, that's like Nietzsche. It's like good to have Nietzsche as educators uh, or even art. It's good to have art as educator, but Nietzsche as master or art as master, right? Not so much. I keep going. You know, a speedily exhaustible means. Find your way. On with the essay. So with the walls of the system blend to their eye in the remote horizon with the walls of the universe, the luminaries of heaven seem to them hung on the arch their master built. They cannot imagine how you aliens have any right to see how you can see, right? How dare you, Greg? It must be somewhat that you stole this, the light from us. It's a very good observation in human behavior, by the way, huh? Yeah. They do not yet perceive that uh, light unsystematic, indomitable, will break into any cabin, even into theirs, right? Like how petty, how pedantic, right? Uh, if you have a light, you must have stolen it from me. Or if you cast a light, I find it offensive because I know it's competing with my light, right? Uh, pre presently, their neat new pinfold will be too straight and low, will crack, will lean, will rot and vanish. And the immortal lights, all young and joyful, million or million colored will beam over the universe as on the mo first morning. You know, he paints quite a picture there. Yeah, you know, this, this reminds me of stealing the light. Um, I was getting a haircut the other day. And the guy who was cutting my hair, he was saying how his wife was becoming a uh, haircut person, right? I don't know what they're, I don't know. What a the haircut person? I, I think that's the, the term they is. use. So you go to, you go to haircut person school? <laughs> <laughs> go on. But anyways, <laughs> but anyways, uh, I said, oh, wow, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. You're both going to be. <laughs> haircut people? Yeah, you're both going to be haircut people. Gender neutral then, too. <laughs> <laughs> then he says, he says, uh. Not really. I mean, it's it's not really that cool. I mean, she kind of just follows me wherever I go. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to laugh right. so much at that, but uh, uh, well, it's funny. It's funny. Um, it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what uh, Emerson's talking about. Well, I mean, how? Let me ask you. Did he? Did he look? Hopefully, like, did he look tired? Was he? It was like he a man like in need of a divorce? Like, how bad was it? Or was he just kind of joking around? He was kind of just joking around. Okay. Um, I figured as much. Barbershop talk. Yeah. Yeah. Barbershop talk. We were just, we were just BS in the whole, the whole time. So, but, but yeah, I mean, like, uh, uh, people get mad when, when other people try to do things that they're doing. Right. right. Um, it's kind of like in, uh, in Life of Brian. Again, I'll bring up that example. I just watched the movie um he starts saying all this stuff and then people start repeating it and he's like go away leave me alone then they're like go away leave me alone <laughs> and then, right and it's like because uh the messiah just wanted uh them to all just leave him alone right uh, yeah it's like oh you were you were too thing. successful then yeah. why did you beg their ear right like if you were if you were to take it seriously right like yeah. to if we if we were to examine this as like a serious parable let's say Right. It's like, I guess the, the moral of that story, careful on whose ears you big. 
uh, or yes. know, know that you're, I mean, again, know that you're asking for a fight. Again, this is all very violent stuff. Like we're talking about coercion. We're talking about forces at work, right? We're not masking it behind morality. We're not masking it behind lies and all that stuff. You know, it says right here is men's prayers are a disease of the will, right? It's like, why do you, <laughs> you know what, you're, you're going to, you're asking God, like he's the, you know, what the universal Santa Claus, like he's some, yeah. like, I don't know if, it's like if you're if like we're all God's dogs and he's the master, we have to beg for a bite. Like, is that the case? You know, something along those lines. Like this, this is kind of the phenomenon he's describing, right? Men's yeah. prayers are a disease of the will, right? It's like you, you know, uh, so are there creeds, creeds a, a disease of the intellect? Same thing. It's like it's still dependence. A creed is dependence. A culture has many. A culture often has more than one creed, right? Like it has, um, you know, a, a lot of creeds within it, let's say but he calls it a disease of the intellect. Hmm. I mean, it is though, because you're, well, I mean, that's what I was telling you a few days ago about hope and how hope can kind of just keep you locked up in chains. Oh yeah. Yeah. It can also, right. And then maybe, maybe, but maybe that's the point. Maybe, maybe, maybe hope is just that dream you get to have forever for tomorrow because you were never that serious to begin with. And doesn't it feel better to console yourself as such at least? Because why else would you be telling yourself this rationalization? Yes. Right. It's very, it's not, it's not like, it's not a pretty place to be. And um, yeah, you definitely wouldn't want to be there or be stuck there or stuck there for long. But, you know, like if you ever read Dr. Seuss's uh, All the Places, yeah, I say all, all the places you'll go, he talks about the waiting place. You remember if you ever did they, did they read that book or did you read that book? In- uh, my aunt gave that book to me as like a high school graduation gift. So, so I read it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. Then it was in there. Uh, yeah. You talked about the waiting places. Uh, it's yeah. pretty good. Something like that comes to mind. Uh, right. And if you have false desires um, or maybe you never uncovered what your, your real desires and which I suppose would be just as bad of a fate. Um, yes, it was. Because then, like, what, what's left of you, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you want to take us away with the uh, number, I guess that's number yeah, that two. Still part number one. Yeah. Number two is next. Two. It is for want of self culture that the superstition of traveling, whose idols are Italy, England, Egypt, retains its fascination for all educated Americans. They who made England, Italy, or Greece venerable in the imagination did so by sticking fast where they were, like an axis of the earth. In manly hours, we feel that duty is our place. The soul is no traveler. The wise man stays at home. When his necessities, his duties, on any occasion, call him from his house or into foreign lands, he is at home still and shall make men sensible by the expression of his countenance that he goes the missionary of wisdom and virtue and visits cities and men like a sovereign and not like an interloper or a valet. Right. You can think of a, a certain a dignity and poise, right? Yeah. You're um, always at home neither, with yourself. Yes. Neither, neither an interloper, right? Doesn't have to be a big deal. Right? It doesn't have to be a, a huge attack and nor am I here to park your car or, you know, see you around um, or take care of your carriage. So, so it's actually funny. Uh, it's one for self culture that this uh, that superstition of traveling. You know, I told a friend of mine a theory that most Americans travel not to actually be in touch with culture, to learn about culture, but to escape it. Like they do it in, you know, and I think it's maybe it's mainly uh, it could it was could just as well be a young person thing. But he was living over in Europe, and you know, he knew a lot of younger expats around him and stuff, right? And as yeah. he traveled around, and you know, because he he was in Spain, he was he was working there, and he goes to see like you know one night, you know, it's you know the the young the youngins are asking him, hey, where are you going? He's like, I'm going down here. This is where the Spanish Civil War took place. I'm you know going to go see history and understand. Uh, look, look at this stuff. And they're like, Oh yeah, we're going to the bar. And then the next day, you know, come to the bar with us. And he's like, no, I'm going to go look at these castles over here. Yeah. You know, like that, you know, tra- traveling is just seeking novelty. But here you go. I had a friend of mine tell me the other day, I qu- kind of question it. Uh, she was talking about kind of the modern existential dread and crisis, which is infected much of, you know, you'd say modern Western thought and being, um, and in her, and she's an artist, and in, in her mind, to her theory, and I think, I think she's right here, I think the psychology and the analysis follows, is that 
she was talking about the example of a huge party that took place on social media and what a novel and actually big deal this is. Like once upon a time, you know, you would have gone somewhere because you had an invitation and because you were welcome there, not just because you could go fundamentally, yeah. right? Like humans have long been particular and it's like now you have this novel notion that anyone can suggest a party and it can quickly get out of hands with, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. But the, this kind of just hedonic treadmill, right? This kind of uh, like... You know, we, it's like Zaf speaking of, you know, even though you can only sit on one throne at a time, the benefit to having more than one throne or more than one pile of riches or whatever the case may be, or more than one car is that it provides endless opportunity for distraction, right? Like you're not actually living life. You're not, you're, you're, you're not here to be present. Like Nietzsche has this one line on one hand where he says, talking about history at his time, saying that no one, no one will want to remember this era because it's the least human era. You know, a hundred years later, we can be like, yes, confirm Nietzsche. No one does want to remember your era. And it's like, well, people don't even want to be present for ours. Why? We never left that least human era. Back to my friend's observation that all this novelty seeking and all this, you know, that the existential dread arises when in frivolously spending one's time, one realizes one is reminded of the temporality of life and that this won't go on forever and then the frivolous usage of the time and a lot of that novel uh, because there's benefits to novelty but there's also like if you're endlessly seeking novelty like emerson criticizes here it's the want of self-culture it's the lack of depth and introspection you're actually looking for distraction you're not actually okay to live where you are you're not okay at your own in your own body you're not okay in your own life right you're not okay alive in this era Right. These are all serious neuroses, uh, neuroses, let's say. Um, can you still hear me OK? Yes. All right. Just making sure I move something. So I want to make sure it's still coming through. And I guess this is just me rephrasing, you know, off the top of my head, uh, rapping here. But, you know, he says it right here. Where is it? Um, he says it himself. The soul Not is just no that, traveler? Uh, yeah, okay. So it's one of self culture uh is for want of self culture that is a superstition of traveling. Those idols whose idols are Italy, England, Egypt, because even then again, my friend traveling over there, it's like, yes, you could in a certain respect, you could understand um you could you could you could make the argument that that what was him searching. But to him, it's like I knew his approach and I knew his methodology. It's a very different approach. Uh he wasn't seeking escape, he was understanding how he was a part of it and how it's played out over time, you know, as a American, as uh, having, you know, both European and native uh, Hispanic blood here. Um, you know, my friend's case. So the soul is no traveler. The wise man stays at home. The soul, the, the soul right? There's also also no, uh, uh, what do you call it? No separation either. Uh, well, this is also being the word, flexible, even, right? Yeah, yeah. And then even using the word soul implies a certain uh, separation of body, mind, a duality that isn't there. But, you know, for the sake of communication, you know, you got to stand somewhere, understand his usage of words here, how he, how yes. he does it. Um, the wise well, man he's talking about the will here. Yes. Oh, yes, exactly. Exactly. You know, the, the soul is no traveler. The wise man stays at home. And when his, nece and, and when his necessities, his duties on, on occasion call him from his house or into a foreign lands, he is home still, you know, bingo. And bingo. shall make men sensible to the expression of his countenance that he goes the missionary of wisdom and virtue and visit cities men alike as sovereign, right? Big difference between the sovereign and the interloper yeah. or the servant. Um, he is a tourist nowhere. Yes. There you go. Okay. That's, that's, that's a very good way of putting it. Uh, yeah. He's, he's at home wherever he goes. And my thoughts are for any of you modern Odysseuses out there, you know, best learn to make your home and take your home with you wherever you go. Uh, Don't forget a sleeping bag. Yeah, and then there's no guarantee that you make it back. So that's yeah. why it's a good thing that you may make your home wherever you go. Yes. Uh, your will, that is. So uh, right. I'll go ahead and read the next part. Yeah. I have no cheerless objection to the circumnavigation of the globe for the purposes of art, of study, and benevolence, so that the man is first domesticated or does not go abroad with the hope of finding somewhat greater than he knows. He who travels, and that's the abyss there, right? Staring into the abyss and having to stare back at you. He who travels to be amused or to get somewhat which he does not carry, travels away from himself and grows old even in youth among old things. In Thebes, in Palmyra, 
his will and mind have become old and dilapidated as they. He carries ruins to ruins. That's kind of like the uh, the dwarf man has become a dwarf. Yes, himself. right, right, exactly. Uh, at this point in the cycle, you could say like, oh, it's like we've lost, like the the, the healthy instincts have become uh, conscious. They become weakened. They become weakened to the point of like, you know, uh, people destroy themselves all the time without even understanding why or how. Um, yeah. You know, that there's so many people that we don't even have to care, right? That like, oh, it doesn't matter how many people destroy themselves. Like we couldn't, we couldn't get rid of ourselves if we wanted. Like people have tried, you know, they built camps and everything, you know? Yeah. Uh, so well, we tried building fat camps, couldn't get rid of those fat people. Tried building um, gay camps, still gay people. And don't work. Uh, so he carries runes to runes. Traveling is next paragraph. Traveling is a fool's paradise. Our first journey discovers to us the difference, the indifference of places, created the observation, uh, right? Especially because it's our culture and character and language that gives meaning to places. It's like, why does this place matter? It's like, if I tell you, oh, this, this house sat on top of a graveyard, it's going to change your image of it versus like, oh, this house, you know, it's just a house. You know, it's, it's in our minds anyway. Traveling yeah. is a fool's paradise. Our first journey discovers to the indifference of places. At home, I dream that at Naples, at Rome, I can be intoxicated with beauty and lose my sadness. And I love this because this is not only are we discussing a native philosopher, an American, right? Because like Emerson's like one of the few Americans you can point to and be like, yeah, you know, uh, if there's a reason to be proud to be American, it's this guy. Um, I can't speak for the masses. I can't speak for a lot of that other stuff. Uh, this guy, though, this guy's money. Um, I can be intoxicated with beauty and lose my sadness, right? That's the, that's the um, repression. That's the escape. I pack my trunk, embrace my friends, embark on the sea, and at last wake up in Naples. And there besides me is the stern fact, the sad self, unrelenting, identical that I fled from. It's been said that, separate from the essay here, it's been said that wherever you go, there you are. Uh, yeah. Emerson confirms. You know, I seek the Vatican and the palaces. I affect to be intoxicated with sights and suggestions, but I'm not intoxicated. My giant goes with me wherever I go. Hmm. Right. So it's under, you know, and it's, and it's like, if you were going to try and gauge and measure here, you know, uh, psychoanalysis wise, it's not morality. It's not good and bad. It's not good and evil. It's, uh, it's probably your best measure here. It's, it's motives, Right. And again, it's not a matter of judgment. It's understanding why people do what they do. What they do. So how about I read all of number three in one go? We'll talk about it for a little bit and then we'll end off from there. Sure. And then maybe that last line from the next paragraph because it's a quintessential one too. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Sounds good. But the rage, three, but the rage of traveling is a symptom of a deeper unsoundness affecting the whole intellectual action. The intellect is vagabond and our system of education fosters re restlessness. Our mind travels when our bodies are forced to stay at home. We imitate and what is imitation, but the traveling of the mind. Our houses are built with foreign tastes. Our shelves are garnished with foreign ornaments. Our opinions, our tastes, our faculties lean and follow the past and the distant. The soul created the arts wherever they have flourished. It was in his mind, it was in his own mind that the artist sought his model. It was the application of his own thought to the thing to be done and the conditions to be observed. And why need we copy the Doric or the Gothic model? Beauty, convenience, grandeur of thought, and quaint expression are as near to us as to any. And if the American artist will study with hope and love the precise thing to be done by him, considering the climate, the soil, the length of the day, the wants of the people, the habit and form of the government. He will create a house in which all these will find themselves fitted and taste and sentiment will be satisfied also. Insist on yourself, never imitate. Your own gift you can present every moment with the cumulative force of a whole life's cultivation, but of the adopted talent of another. You have only an extemporaneous half possession that which each can do best none but his maker can teach him no man yet knows what it is nor can till the person has has exhibited it where is the master who could have taught shakespeare where is the master who could have instructed franklin or washington or bacon or newton every great man is a unique 
the Scipionism of, of Scipio is precisely that part he could not borrow. Shakespeare will never be made by the study of Shakespeare. Do that which is assigned to you, and you cannot hope too much or dare too much. There is at this moment for you an utterance brave and grand as that of the colossal ch chisel of Phidias or trowel of the Egyptians or the pen of Moses or Dante, but different from all these, not possibly will the soul all rich, all eloquent, with thousand cloven tongue deign to repeat itself. But if you can hear what these patriarchs say, Surely you can reply to them in the same pitch of voice, for the ear and the tongue are two organs of one nature. Abide in the simple and noble reasons of thy life. Obey thy heart, and thou shalt reproduce the full world again. Oh, so good. Then you wanted me to read the... <sighs> oh, no, I was just... just I, 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 I was just actually thinking, no... Uh, that that when you said whole section of three, I thought you meant just the first paragraph. I didn't. Uh, I wasn't, wasn't sure about the second one there, but I see what you meant now. Oh, okay. So that was it. No, that's good. Um, cool. Yeah, you know uh, the difference between um, symptoms and sickness. The well, intellect yeah, I mean, is this a vagabond, is like... and our no, and, and our culture has fostered this for for hundreds yeah. of years now. The intellect is a vagabond. Our system of education fosters restlessness. Not only that, it puts it puts intelligent people in learning disability class. Probably by you know, by yeah. I don't know, if you scale it up to three hundred fifty million people, that's either going to be hundreds and thousands or millions of of, of young people. Uh, like the system cannot differentiate the human. You know, it just can't. Yeah. It's not designed to accommodate us. It's it's pretty much this goes back to culture's violence. It really is a corralling system now. Yeah. And look, this was back in Emerson's time. Now it's worse than ever because it's needed to accommodate such large forces of people, uh, such masses of people. Yeah. Right. So well, you know, I mean, now we're kind of about um, like sending yourself off to be someone else. It's about like imitating someone else. About yes. Uh, trying to wear someone else's shoes but they're like yes. too tight right they're they're uncomfortable yeah or their clothes are too big and then also uh it's he's also talking about the importance of creation and the importance of the artist right yes um that all the study of shakes and you could say the same thing Nietzsche all the study of Nietzsche won't produce a Nietzsche all the study of a Shakespeare won't produce a Shakespeare yes. you know, there's this funny line from Nietzsche where he says I want to say maybe it's the gay science, but I don't remember where it is. But he, where he says something like he thought one day a great thinker was going to come along and just dazzle him or something like that. And I remember yes. once thinking the same thing about America going like, oh, we're going to make a, like someday we'll have a great philosopher or something like that. And then you go like, oh, wait, they already came and went and their conditions are not right to do that. You know, again, if we're just, produ if we're producing a lot of followers, like we're not, you know, we're producing scholars, we can produce scholars, great thinkers much harder right um in this the way the system itself is designed and gated and uh the way the value system works therein and the way it's actually all very well channeled and brooked and you know uh is to the point to be impotent to where an artist you know there's serious questions of well you know are artists and philosophers enough to salvage this culture you know philo uh, like you could say socrates believed in himself of his time emerson believed in himself in his time you know, and I, and I yes. hope that the philosophers of our time believe in themselves as well, because there's no way out or around it, you know? Uh, well, you have to believe in yourself, because if you don't believe in yourself, then you're, you're just imitating someone else, right? Um, because you're believing in something else outside of yourself. I mean, that's like, uh, that's what prayer is, right? You're, right. you're well, believing well, in... Yes. Well, yeah. here we go. Uh, this, this is actually important. And I, I, we, we kind of skimmed over it earlier, but I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, he just said it earlier. Remember where he says something like, uh, let me scroll up to find it. Um, well, wait, uh, say what you just said again. Let's see if it registers. Well, uh, prayer. I mean, you're, you're putting your life in someone else's hands, right? Um, right. Uh, people who don't believe in themselves, they're believing in something else. They're believing oh, right. in um, someone else. They're believing in someone else's words, right? right? Someone else has, someone else will come along to save me. 
so someone yeah. else has the answers, right? And this, but this is the dependence of culture because we're taught to look up to that. And, you know, it's very natural in childhood, right? You look up to your parents and otherwise, right? Yeah. Anyone cool who comes along, you know, it doesn't even have to be that impressive. It's just like, wow, that person's a teenager. Like they're older than me. That's powerful, you know, <laughs> like that to you as a child, you see yeah. the power there. And, and exactly. you, can't, you can't exactly identify with the adults, but you identify with the teenager. Like that's close. That's more in reach, you would say. Yeah. So you can think of very definitive moments moments of what this feels like and what it looks like. Um, we were talking about the, also the, the importance of the artist. Um, I like it right here. This is that which they call a holy office is not so much as brave and manly. It reminds me like when people say the future is female, it's like when I, that's, yes. that's when I usually think like, is that why people here are so passive aggressive? <laughs> uh, and that might, that might just be liberal Christianity dregs left over though. That's what I think that is. It's just, you know, a bunch of overly socialized, overly polite, overly educated people uh, in a country where things are quite good. Um, yet everyone's, you know, many people are unhappy. You know, it's just, it, it's yeah. the soup, right? These were the ingredients that went into our cultural soup. A big part of that is the dependence. Um, I'm still looking, there's, there's a very crucial line though. I have to go back and find it. What can you think of what it said? Mm, it was similar to a sentiment you mentioned in passing earlier. Uh I'm, I'm going, I'm scrolling. Yeah, back down to number three. Yeah. Quaint expression is that any of the American artists will study you hope the precise thing to be done by him. Okay, the, this, so this is an important distinction. The American artist will study with hope and love the precise thing to be done by him, considering the climate, the soil, the length of the day, the wants of the people, the habit, the form of the government. He will create a house in which all these will find themselves fitted and taste and sentiment will be satisfied also. Uh, Nietzsche speaks to the same sentiment. Um, the question of saying, you know, it's to the philosopher and their needs, like their approach to philosophy and life, you know, it could vary depending on their place and time and the people they find on them, find themselves amongst. Yes. You know, insist on yourself, never meditate. Uh, This is it. Never imitate your own gift. You can present every moment, the cumulative force of a whole life's cultivation. That's actually what you're offering. Someone isn't going to see that in a moment because they don't, they look at you and they, again, they might not, they might be completely unimpressed. But then a lifetime of knowledge and wisdom, you know, what can you present? What can you show? What can you demonstrate? Things like that come to mind. Uh, you had mentioned something about this earlier uh, in passing. And I thought, I thought it was a brilliant observation. And it was just, it was another kind of encapsulation of that sentiment. Um, you know, that to go to another person to get your wisdom, it's like, yeah, at most, you're going to remember a fraction of what they say. You know, you need to to understand it in your own way, in your own methodology, on your own terms, in your own language, in your own being, in your own home, wherever that home may take you or wherever you may take that home. Yeah. Right. It's not there's there's a big difference. Right. Well, that's well, why like, in school they said, you know, write it in your own words. Right. Write right. It in your own words. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, it's, that's part of the domestication process, too. Right. Write it in yeah. your own words. You know, you don't even know by, by that time. It's like you're so used to using other people's words. It's absurd to even say that. You know, because it's like, hey, did, yeah. <laughs> you, did you did you coin any of those phrases? Did you contribute to any of the culture? No, but we're going to pretend like you can do it. It's kind of like art class. You know, it's absurd yeah. to think that you can actually teach art, you know, to the degree that if someone's an artistically inclined, they're going to do it regardless. Yeah. And then but there's a reason why we give merit to it. Yet, I, you could also say that in many ways, we don't the scale on which we measure still never accounts for the full amount. Um, even then. So abide in the simple and noble regions of thy life, obey thy heart, and thou shalt reproduce the four world again. And that's a good place to stop. Cool. Yeah, let's stop there. Um, thanks for coming on again, Mina. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, we, so we'll return with uh, part eight of Self-Reliance. It's going to be the last installment of this series. Then we're going to do a recap after that of... Uh, of everything going back. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll, maybe we'll, just, we'll jot down a few notes of like major themes and ideas. Do it like that. Maybe. Yeah. 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 And we can even meet up and uh, just kind of talk about uh, what we should go over. Yeah. I definitely want, I definitely want to ask you, especially by the time we're done, if I imagine that's another month or so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How your own thoughts have and mind has changed over time as we've read through this and as we've talked about yeah. it yeah i'd definitely be interested to hear 
some of your thoughts or even your experiences in the time between back then and now yeah. of how you've seen this in yourself and others. Yes. Yes. Um, then what, so we'll, uh, so we're leaving off at uh, the beginning of page 19 of the math.dartmouth.edu. The link will be in the description. And uh, we're leaving off at abide in the simple and noble regions of thy life. Obey the, thy heart and thou shalt reproduce the four world again. We will continue on number four as our religion, our education, our art, look abroad, blah, 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 blah. So uh, anyways, okay. go check out basilbazaar.com. And uh, that's Mino's website. It's awesome. I've talked about it before. And go check out into-the-absurd.com as well. Um, that's my website. You'll get all the episode updates. You'll have all the platforms there, um, all the links to my social media uh, with Into the Absurd, uh, everything. So anyways, take it easy. Be self-reliant. And don't forget to insist on yourself and never imitate. So anyways. Take it easy.